Good morning, Singapore. Yeah, I kind of feel like good morning, Vietnam this morning. Um, been talking to a lot of people, had late, late night conversations last night. And to be honest, I'm really grateful for my voice. So as much, most of you know, I've been doing this podcast for a long time. I like talking to myself. I can't help it. Hey, Anitra. And I feel really good about the things that I end up talking about. And a lot of times they are provoked or instigated by things I've been listening to or conversations I've had. You've known this for years, right? I've been doing this for about two years now. So people I talk to, um, podcasts I've listened to, books I've read, TV stuff. I mean, I did one on um, Jane the Virgin late last night, right? And I really, really like to pay attention because there are so many things that resonate with me on a daily basis that I feel like, okay, you know what? Yes, that speaks to exactly what I believe in. This is my belief. This is how I feel. And I'm so glad these people are talking about these things. So yesterday we were talking about vulnerability and men and the fact that, um, good God, yes, Justin Baldoni uh, was talking about how he was done trying to be man enough to do whatever is expected of him. And I was listening to Brene Brown this morning because I was trying to just, you know, make use of the time that I have as I putter around the kitchen in the morning and make coffee and stuff like that to make sure that I'm filling my mind with good, useful things. This is how I stay creative, right? This is how I continue to um, make use of all the small spaces of time and be really productive in the mornings. So for those of you who know or don't, it doesn't matter, (laughs) I deal with emotional intelligence and I want for the people around me to be emotionally successful, but for that to happen, I need you to be self-aware. Now, the conversation I had with um, with August yesterday, we had a live podcast session. We were talking about generational curses. We were talking about how, you know, what we saw our parents do, we end up kind of doing ourselves, but how are we changing that so that the next generation, our kids, don't suffer the same way we did. We end up talking about money. We end up talking about how we do, you know, deal with money, how we maintain the status quo a lot of times. How do we maintain that job just over broke because y'all know (laughs) we wait for that next paycheck to come in and we like we we cut it real close it would be like the 25th of the month and you're looking at last hundred bucks before your next paycheck comes in yes that's just over broke but it is a mindset where you're thinking okay well i got a raise this year and now i can afford to spend on more stuff instead of save that extra amount of money so we know how to maintain we know how to pay the bills and get that done But what we don't always talk about, which is really, really difficult for us, is how do we build wealth? Like, honestly speaking, full transparency, full disclosure, I can manage my house on about 500 bucks a month because I am very blessed. I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm very grateful. I'm very blessed. My mom's house is paid off. I live in my mom's house. Now, I am building from scratch. And I did have great jobs where I, where I brought in like $4,000 a month or whatever. But at the time I had a maid that cost 500 bucks and I had insurance that cost 500 bucks and I wanted to go out and eat all the time. And I was eating out because I was at work, right? I don't pack lunch and take it to work. It was too much effort. So all those things, end of each month, I didn't have anything to, to keep. I did not pay myself. I did not put away in savings. I didn't do nothing that was worth doing. I was just managing my money. But what we don't talk about is how we how do we save money? How do we make our money work for us? How do we put aside and make sure that we have enough for a rainy day just in case? And we talked to a lot of people. A lot of people called in. And they said, you know, they they made sure that their child was, while they were deployed or while they were in training, basic training, whatever, they put aside the money as much as they could. They paid their bills, but they put aside the entire leftover amount. And a lot of people, you know, don't want to talk about money because it's uncomfortable. It suddenly calls it to question whether you are of value or not. It calls it to question your self-esteem and your worth as a human being. You know, all the people around you, how much are they making and how much are you making? And at the end of the day, if you can't save anything, what does that say about you? What are your spending habits like? What does that mean, right? So that's one part of that vulnerability because August and I got on a call afterwards just to, you know, shoot the shit and see how we were doing. We're still really good friends outside of the coaching client relationship. And we talked for a little bit. And something that I've I've been kind of, you know, tur- turning over and over in my mind came to the surface again. What we refuse to talk about, that's where the work actually is. I'll give you an example. I was hanging out with a guy. And it wasn't dating or anything. We were just hanging out, right? And um, the more we talked, the more I liked him. I liked the way he saw the world. I liked the way he decided to live his life. And I mean, he pushed everything to 
the edge of exhaustion. He ran from pillar to post. He was doing everything possible, you know, and I really liked this guy. And it was odd for me because I didn't want to admit that I liked him. And I didn't want to tell him that I liked him. And I didn't want to tell anybody else that I liked him. Because what does that say about me? Because I had to call into question what kind of person he was, where he was from, what his age was, what his background was. And then I had to check myself and be like, well, what is my age? And what is my status? And what have I been doing the last 25, 30 years? So I did not want to have that conversation. Actually, I still don't. But we have broached the conversation a couple of times. And we've left it be for now because we just have other things we need to do. And I don't want to be worrying about this the rest of my life either. But it, it caused him to question who I am as a person. Now, I, my, I see myself as a person of great value. I think I'm great. I think I am, you know, athletically built. I think I have a great head on my shoulders. I think I'm very intelligent. I think I can com- hold a conversation with anybody. But in my culture, what people see is not necessarily my intelligence. It's not necessarily the way I dress or the way I walk or the way I talk or the way I spend money. What they see is my status. How much money do I make? Do I have a steady job? Oh, she has a child. Is she able to take care of that child well? Oh, she's divorced. What was it about her that made her marriage not work? What was it about her that made her marriage fail? So those are things that could call it into question. And while I would love to talk about those things, I kind of don't want to because that's going to kick my ego in the ass a little bit. And who wants that, actually? But I also know with all of my work about self-awareness and emotional intelligence, I know for me, I have no problem talking about myself. If it will help you figure out what you need to do next, fine. I will bear all. That's fine. But what I'm not comfortable with doing and that August has helped me do is tell a group of strangers my story all at the same time. I'll pull anecdotes. I'll show you, you know, the funny side of things and the crazy side of things. And that time I lost my temper and that time I was, you know, managed to hold it all together with a toothpick. But what I've been struggling to do is tell my story from back, like from the front to back. I've been avoiding certain things. I don't want to admit that I want someone around. I don't want to admit the fact that, yeah, I would love to be married again. Because once I say that out loud, I kind of have to accept the fact that, yeah, but it's going to be hard because now I have a couple layers of protection added to me. I have a daughter. You have to get past her. I have a past. You have to get past that. I have a couple years under my belt. You got to get past that. So to be able to hold a conversation with me, great. But once you hear those things, how you respond to me afterwards changes, guaranteed changes. Most people that I've talked to, you know, we have a conversation. I'm open to having conversations. I'm not really looking to date around or anything. I'm not the dating kind of girl. I don't go out and, you know, have, I don't, I don't have casual sex. That's not just, it's just not who I am. But the minute people find out all those details about me, when it becomes one of those, you know, those conversation moments where you're trying to figure out the longevity of this potential friendship, they shut down. And as much as I would like to ask them why, I'd rather go with the story I'm telling myself, which actually kind of beats me up a little bit. But that's the problem. We're not being vulnerable. We're not putting ourselves out there. We're not asking the questions. And those difficult conversations, the things that we aren't saying, those are the most important things. I remember um, one of my friends, uh, De- no, not Damari, I'm sorry, Imani, I sent her something. Whenever I see something that would help my fellow coaches or that, you know, kind of like backs up their theory and how they do things, I send it to them, right? It's what I do. I send information to people and it's like, yo, you know, we were just talking about this and yeah, you're absolutely right because this person feels the same way too. So I sent her something about, you know, um, a woman's workload, you know, what, what she has to carry within a marriage and she posted it. Uh, on Facebook and asked for people to ring in on what they thought. And she, she's very sweet. She, she sent me props for having sent it to her in the first place. And when I read some of the comments, I was like, wow, you know, yeah. 
yes, I've had to hold it all together is usually the comment from a lot of the women. Yes, I have to hold it all together. I have to make sure that everything gets done. I'm the organizer in the family. Yeah, that's true. That's usually what we end up doing. But there's a lot of stuff that's left unsaid as well. So that's where I, you know, I chimed in and I said, yeah, I held it together because I could. But I also know that before I met my husband, he was able to hold it together too, without me. Without his baby mama's help, and there's a couple of them, okay, he was able to hold it together. He may not have been doing a great job. He was doing what he could. He was putting it together, you know, piece by piece. And when I came along, I offered a, a level of security and comfort for him where he could kind of relax and I could take over. And it wasn't that I wanted to take over. I kind of was hoping to co-parent, but that's not what happened and that's okay. But here's where my communication broke down. I did not ever feel comfortable telling him that I needed help. But here's why. I would test him on small things. If I had to ask him because I'd lost my job, if I had to ask him for a hundred bucks to put food on the table, this is not a hundred bucks to go get my nails and hair done, okay? It's a hundred bucks to put food on the table and I can make a hundred bucks last, trust me. The fact that it took me courage to ask you for a hundred bucks and for you to respond with, oh, you know what? I'm going to have to keep track of all the money you asked me for. That was a gut punch to me. That tells me that you're keeping track of all the, the asks that I have. Okay, All the times I ask you for help, you're keeping track of that. Like I need to pay you back at some point. That to me is not love. At least not my definition of love. Love is unconditional. If I see you are in need, before you ask, I will offer. That's just who I am. But I had to come to grips with the fact that he was not raised that way. He was, he taught himself to keep checking his back because even his mother had come after him and his money before. So he had taught himself these things. But what I, what I was unable to say was, this hurts my feelings that you want to keep track of money I'm asking you for. I'm not asking you for me. I'm asking you for us. And I would like to understand why you, you feel like you need to keep track. Because if I had asked him that question, I would have forced him to have that conversation with me where he could explain what he felt and I could maybe adjust how I felt or he, he could maybe adjust to how I felt. I was not giving him space to rescue me because there were a lot of things that were being left unsaid. I was not giving him the ability to feel like I needed him because what I was doing instead was shutting down instead of saying what was on my mind and how I felt about things. Those are the difficult conversations we should be having. Now, this doesn't have to happen in a marriage. You may not be married. You may be dating. You may not be dating either. It may be something that's happening at work. I've been there too. I was that employee that got told off all the time. Because I was learning a new um, a new assistant, right? I was learning opera. I worked in the hotel. I'd never seen opera before. But it's logic-based, as most programs are. So I was able to figure it out if you gave me the chance to figure it out. But in a hotel, everything is fast-paced. Everything deals with money. Reservations get, you know, knocked off of the books. Um, you could misplace someone's reservation and booking you could put them in the wrong room even though you had the notes of what their preferred rooms and all that stuff is right there's a lot of things that could go wrong if you don't pay attention but part of learning is i've got to fail a couple times to realize that there's this loophole in the system and there's that loophole in the system and i need to really make sure i double check these this and this because if i don't this is what will happen now they will tell you exactly what to do in order the correct way but what they won't usually teach you is what happens if you don't do it that way. What happens if you rush through because you're panicking because the guest is in front of you and they're impatient and you're scared because you've never done this before. But, you know, the front desk is being bum rushed by lots of arrivals at the same time. And you can't ask your team leader to help you out because they're also at a computer standing somewhere else dealing with a guest who's yelling at them. You have to kind of wing it. And what you want to do more than anything is slow the whole process down so you can really think it through. But you got to, uh -huh, yes, okay, yes, sir, I understand, yes, sir, I understand, while they're yelling at you and think at the same time. There is not a lot of room at work for failure because they want it to be that efficient. 
but what they don't seem to understand is while you have people that you get to shadow for a little while so you can see what the work is, you don't really begin learning until you get your hands on the computer and you don't have someone by your side. You've got to go through that process of making mistakes. But then you also need a place where you can tell people, hey, I made this mistake, I understand. And I know you need to write me up, but I need to understand what the process was and where I went wrong. Usually the first response at work is to write you up. You mis- you made a mistake. I told you not to do this, but you did it anyway. It wasn't because I wanted to. Because at that time, logically, that felt like the right thing to do. Or that was my go-to. Or that was, it looked similar to this other screen, so I thought I was doing the right thing. But to have a leader that will hold space for you to make mistakes and then explain where you went wrong and what you need to pay, you know, work on because they've been through it themselves is priceless. That's true leadership. Now, if it wasn't for a few choice people that they didn't hold my hand, they kicked my ass first, but afterwards they were like, look, I know you want to quit. I know you're upset, but you need to understand this is the weight of the work that you're doing, the gravity of the work that you're doing, and you need to understand that this, this, and this has to happen. Otherwise, now you know the hard way that if this, this, and this doesn't happen, the quant- the consequence is this other situation. Once I'd been through that, like that whole process of like being that that employee that got in trouble all the time, I became a great leader. I felt like I did anyway. At least some of the people that worked with me felt like I was a good leader. Because what would happen is they would send all the trainees to me. They would send all the newbies that were having trouble to me. And I would teach them, I would teach them, I would teach them. But I would teach them the logic behind it, as well as the psychology that you're going to go through when you screw up. I took that weight off their shoulders because I had been there before. Because I know what they weren't going to say. Because I'd been there before. And because I knew what they weren't going to say, I could take that piece of information that I lived through, that experience that I lived through, and translate it into their language where they would understand, well, shit, okay, she's not just harping on me to do this, this, and this. She understands she's been through here before. She's been through this little valley before. Vulnerability is the key to really, really strong relationships. But it is a two-way street. And sometimes you got to be the bigger person and show whoever it is that you're in a relationship with that it's okay to open up and tell people how you feel. Nothing happens by osmosis, okay? I wish it was that easy, but it isn't. Actually, I don't wish it was that easy because I don't really want to hear everyone's thoughts. But I've got to open up in order for you to trust me so that you can open up. And let's face it, that's really what the no like factor, no like trust factor is about, right? You know who I am, you like who I am, you trust who I am. For business, online. I know I'm not for everybody. I know not everybody's going to cool, feel like, damn, okay, she's cool and I can, I can tell her about my problems. I know that. But I also know that I can't begin to do the real work unless I'm open about who I am and what I'm going through. Being vulnerable has been uncomfortable for me for a long time. I started out as an introvert, mostly because I was the only girl in like a house full of boys. All my cousins were boys. We lived with our cousins a lot. So I have two brothers and I have two male cousins and a lot of times I wasn't even allowed to play with them. I wanted to. But it's not ladylike to run around shooting bows and arrows and playing war. (laughs) It wasn't ladylike to run around in shorts. Because I wasn't supposed to show my legs. Even though I was like, I don't know, 10, 11. It wasn't ladylike to, you know, rough and tumble with the guys. But that's what happens when you play with a bunch of guys. They end up knocking into each other or knocking people over. And that's just the way it was. But it wasn't appropriate because I was a girl. So I felt left out. And I didn't feel like I really identified with many of the girls because I grew up with boys I know how they think I think the same way and that's just the way it was but being plucked out of whatever comfort zone I was in continually 
and being placed in new schools, new countries, new housing situations. I don't know how many times we moved in Australia, man, seriously. I think I went to, I think I went to like eight different schools in a span of four years. So yeah, I got really used to being the new girl, which also meant that I didn't have to open up to you and tell you who I was. I could pretend I was a better version of myself based on what didn't work at the last school. But that didn't work for long either. There are things about what I was trying to assimilate into that I didn't like and that didn't fit me. And it looked super awkward because it wasn't who I was. And I wish I knew then, but I definitely know now. And now I get to have those hard conversations. Those are the conversations I really look forward to, actually. Those are the conversations where I feel like we're really actually doing something productive. We're talking about things that matter. I don't want to talk about people. I want to talk to people. I want to rediscover that I am not alone. I want you to discover that you are not alone. I want you to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because when you get comfortable being uncomfortable and bearing your soul and telling people like it is, there's less you have to lie about. Yes, there is such a thing as lying by omission, people, okay? So the things that are left unsaid are actually really important. Stop worrying about the story that you're telling yourself about what something means. Start telling people how you actually feel. And if they're for you, they will be there still. And if they're not, maybe they'll come around. But for now, they're, you're going to lose a couple people. But that's okay. That's okay. That's good. That's what I want y'all to understand. The people that matter, they'll stick around. They'll find a way to stick around. Just like we find a way to scrounge up the money to go drinking every weekend, but somehow at the end of the month don't have enough to cover the bills. Just like that. The people that love you and really care, they will find a way. And the people that don't, well, it's better to know now, right? Than spend any more time. So, if nothing else from this, I want you to think about the things you don't say. And why don't you say them? What would happen if you actually said what was on your mind? Would people get to know you better? Could they really fall in love with you then? Would you feel like you had less to hide and you could really show up? Wouldn't that be something? I'm just saying. All right, you guys. I'll catch you later. But I look forward to seeing your comments. Write to me. Let's have that conversation.